Oh, well, good morning, church. Thank you. All right. Hey, we finally got a hold of this. It's been like 12 months, and finally we got a response. That's awesome. Thank you for that. All right, so uh, what a great opportunity we have to come before the Lord this morning and to lift up his name and to worship our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And as always, it's an honor to be here and just to play through these songs and to, to sing and to lift up our voices. And it's always wonderful to look out and see all the smiling faces. And thank you for being here in the room. And for those that are watching online, thank you uh, for tuning in this morning. I pray that uh, everything that we do here would be pleasing to our Lord and Savior and it would be uplifting to you and that we would all leave closer to our God than when we walked in this morning as a result of what happens here. So if you will, let's stand together, and we're going to ask the Lord to come and be a part of our worship service this morning. As always, we don't want to just be up here just making noise for no reason. You know, when we do this, we do this for one reason, and that's to lift up the name of Jesus and to draw people closer to Him. So that's what we want. We want the Spirit of the Lord to come and sweep across this place and move in the midst this morning. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, thank you for everything that you do for us. Thank you for loving us and taking care of us, and thank you for this place that we have to come and worship. Thank you for our brother Ryan and his leadership. Thank you for the message that you've given him this morning. I pray that you speak through him. I pray that everybody that's on stage gets moved out of the way, and what's left is the presence of a holy God right here in this room. As we put forth our best efforts this morning, God, we know that they're not worthy of you. So we try to bring you something of worth. We bring you the sacrifice of praise this morning. So dear Lord, forgive us of our sins, the things we say and the things we have done that are wrong. Anything that would get between us and you. I rebuke those things in Jesus' name. So as we come before your throne this morning, God, I pray that what you hear and what you see would be pleasing to you. And all those things I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So a couple of weeks ago, we introduced a song called Good and Gracious King, or last week. And, and um, just the words in this thing are so deep and rich, and that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to sing it again because, you know, you know the reason why that we know all the words to those great hymns, Amazing Grace, and, and uh, all, those, all those great hymns that are in the hymn book is because we sang them. You know, that's the reason why, that we know them, because we sing them. So this particular song just it really hits me um, directly to my soul. And it, the very first line is, I approach the throne of glory, and nothing in my hands I bring. And there's a reason why I can't bring anything before a holy God, because I'm not worthy of that. There's nothing I have that he needs, that he desires me, and he desires you. He wants you to come before him this morning and lay your burdens down before him. So that he can be who he is. He can be God. He can remove the pain from your life. He can remove the burdens from your life if we would just do it. But we like to hang on to those things, don't we, as people? I know I do. So this morning, as we sing through this and uh, as we teach this song to the congregation, I pray that it will, the words will ring true to you this morning. So follow along and sing along as Lexi leads us in this one. the throne of glory nothing in my hands I bring but the promise of acceptance from a good and gracious king I will give to you my burden as you give to me your strength. Come and fill me with your spirit as I sing to you this praise. You deserve the greater
Lift your voices, church. That he would leave his place on high. Come for sinful man to die. You count it strange, so once did I.
This morning, let's give the Lord all the honor and the glory he deserves. Amen. Our Savior is alive this morning. And church, you may be seated. Amen. Are you glad that Jesus lives? Praise God. That is a game changer, and he's worthy of our praise. It is so good to see each of you here this morning. I hope that you are having a great day. To our guests, thank you for worshiping with us. There is a worship guide that's just outside these doors. If you happen to pick one up, if you don't mind to scan the guest pass there, and that will take you to a connection card to fill out if you don't mind doing that. Otherwise, if you don't mind, you can also go to the welcome desk and fill out a card. We'll give you a free gift for doing that. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you to everybody for being here. I know it's been a difficult week for many of you. I know that sickness is spreading rapidly, and I know that there is great concern, but we have a God who is faithful, and we want to be sure to spend extra time this week and each and every day in prayer, giving it over to him, because he is still on his throne. And so would you join me in prayer as we just want to lift up the name of the Lord here in this place. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, you're so good to us, and God, these are, are difficult times for so many people as we think about families that have lost loved ones and families that are losing loved ones. God, our heart breaks for them. And I pray, God, that your comfort would be on them in a very special way. We do know that life is short and we, we know we can't even expect the next day, but we know you're in control. And I just pray, God, that your comfort would be on us as we proceed day in and day out. I pray that we would live in your strength and that we would count our days, recognizing that they're precious gifts from God, and that we would make the most of them for your glory and honor. I pray today that as we continue this time of worship, that the name of Jesus would be exalted above every name, and that we would turn our eyes upon you. We know that you are on your throne. We know that you're in control, sovereign and supreme. And because of that, God, we don't have to worry because of that, we don't have to be fearful. We don't have to be anxious. We know you're in control, and we give you the praise for who you are. And I pray today, if there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus as their Savior, I pray that they would repent of their sin and place their faith only in Christ, and today, Jesus would save them. We love you today and pray all this in the sweet name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Stand with us, church. sing about our Savior's love and how it is something greater than we can really understand or comprehend. I pray that you'll sing this with us this morning. Beneath the broken shadow Sin and death did reign. The King of glory left his throne aside. The clouds of heaven opened, and mercy fell like rain. 
to bring the dark and past the future bright. Something greater, something greater has come. Upon the cross of Shalrod, the cup of wrath ran dry. The dying Savior drinking every drop. The sting of death accepted, the final breath of love. Our greatest gain was heaven's greatest loss. Something greater, something greater has come. Something greater, something greater has come. Has come. You are greater, greater than anything I've known or seen. You're stronger, stronger than the grave that once held me. Your love is deeper and wider. In the highest place, be lifted. I am still. Oh, you have and always will be something greater. Oh, 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 oh. something greater. Oh, 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 oh. In the silence there was broken. On the third day in the tomb. Oh, as the Savior's heart began to pulse again. Then the Lamb arose in glory with fire in his eyes and the keys of death and Hades in his hand. Oh, now the kingdom of darkness will not stand. Oh, the King of kings has died and rose again. You are greater, greater than See, you're stronger, stronger than the grave that once held me. Your love is deeper and wider in the highest place. Be lifted, I am still. Oh, you have and always will be something greater. The blind are going to see, and the lame is going to run, and the sin is going to sing, and the mourn is going to dance, and the blind are going to see, and the lame is going to run, for the sin is going to see. Oh, cause Jesus is alive, and he's won the victory. So let the prodigal come home, let the captive be set free, and the kingdom's gonna come, and the church is gonna see, cause Jesus is alive, oh, and he's won the victory. You are greater, greater than anything I've known or seen, you're stronger stronger than the grave that once held me for well, you are greater greater than everything i know nor see you're stronger stronger than the grave that once held me your love is deeper and wider and the highest place be lifted i am still oh you have and always will Lift him up this morning. Something greater has come.
sing this with me, church. In peace like a reed attended by when sorrows like sea billows roll what Thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul, it is well with my soul.
Church, can we sing that chorus one more time? Just lift our voices, voices alone, ready? It is well. It is well with my soul. With my soul. It is well. It is well with my soul. You may be seated, church. Amen. Amen. Today, if you will, open your Bibles to the book of John, chapter 15. John 15 will be my text, and as you are turning there, all the children can be dismissed to Children's Church, ages 4 through 1st grade. Glad to have you guys with us. As always, parents, please be sure to pick them up after church. John chapter 15, if you're there, say amen. Amen. Praise God. Great, great text of scripture today that we're going to read here in just a moment. But you guys know that fruit comes from a fruit tree, but where do chickens come from? They come from poultry. This is going to be the start of a new sermon series about the fruit of the Spirit. And before we get into Galatians 5, We are going to look at Jesus' teaching about fruit in John chapter 15. So John chapter 15, verses 1 through 11, we are going to see what Jesus has to say about fruit. And so starting in verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. Our Father, we love you today. Thank you for this incredible passage of scripture, and I pray that it would cause us to draw near the cross today, and that we would see how vital it is that we stay connected to that vine and live out that connection that we have in that vine who is Christ I pray today, God, that you'd be glorified and that we would come to recognize what your expectations are for us as Christians. We love you and pray these things in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. This is the seventh and the final of the I am statements that you see in the gospel according to John. In John chapter 6, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. In John chapter 8, Jesus said, I am the bread the light of the world. In John chapter 10, he says, I am the door. And he also says, I am the good shepherd. In John chapter 11, he says, I am the resurrection and the life. In John 14, he says that I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And here in John 15, the seventh of the I am statements, Jesus says, I am the true vine. Now with each of these I am statements, Jesus is claiming deity. And he is also saying that he is the I am that was revealed to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. 
He is saying that he always has been, and he always will be, and he is enough. And so, church, as we look at any of the I am statements in John, we need to be reminded of the fact that no matter what we're going through in our lives, God in Christ is always enough. He is I am. And some of you need to be reminded today that Jesus is I am. In John chapter 15, Jesus is preparing his disciples for his death, his burial, his resurrection, and his ascension. John 14, 15, and 16 is commonly known as the upper room discourse. And as Jesus is talking to the disciples, he is giving them tips on what it means to live out your life as a disciple of Christ. What are marks of a disciple? What does it look like to follow Jesus? So that's what he's doing here in John chapter 15. And he says to them here in this text that a mark of the disciple, a true disciple, is that they will bear fruit. So what I want to do is give you three actions, three things that we need to be doing as disciples of Christ. You ready for them? First off is this. In verses 1 through 6, we're going to see that we need to inspect our fruit. Inspect our fruit. Now, what does Jesus mean by fruit? Is he talking about apples and bananas and pears? No, he's not talking about that kind of fruit, although it's a good idea to inspect that kind of fruit before you eat it. But fruit that I'm talking about here and what Jesus is talking about, I define it like this. Evidence that Jesus has transformed your life. Fruit is evidence that Jesus has transformed your life. It's not about changed behavior. You can go to a lot of secular organizations, get a lot of good accountability, and it will result in you not doing things that you used to do in some cases. But what Jesus wants to do is not only just change your behavior, he wants to give you a new heart. And only Jesus can do that. And so when we're talking about him being the I am, he is the one that produces this fruit in our lives. Let me give you a couple of other ideas about fruit. Fruit is not outward success. A lot of people look at a successful evangelist or a, a preacher with a very large church or a teacher with a, a lot of people in their Bible study and they say, wow, look at all of that great fruit. We need to remember genuine fruit is not man-made. It comes from the Holy Spirit. So it's not about external religion or having a successful program. It comes from Christ and it is for Christ. Deceivers and hypocrites can paint fruit on a tree, and everybody might be fooled, but it is not real fruit. And we see in Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23, what the Apostle Paul calls the fruit of the Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not sleeping on the job. He is at work producing his fruit in your life. And one way that we know that we're saved is if the Holy Spirit is living inside of us. And we know the Holy Spirit is living inside of us if he produces the fruit of the Spirit. And so in the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at the various fruit of the Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And the thing about this list, it's so important to look at, is that Jesus is the perfect example of all of those things. He's 100% love, 100% joy, peace, and so on and so forth. But every one of us that looks at that list, none of us can say, I'm nailing that list. I'm just doing perfect on all those categories. No, we're all falling short of it. But the evidence of the work of the Holy Spirit is, is that you're not where you used to be, but you're also not where you want to be, but the Holy Spirit is working in you to make you more like Jesus. So just like I said there, Jesus is 100% love, we're not there yet, but the Holy Spirit is making us more loving, making us more kind and joyful and peaceful and, and all of those things. So what we're going to do today is we're going to look at three ways to inspect whether or not you have fruit in your life. Is there transformation in your life that Jesus has caused? It's not about going through motions or going through religion or making sure you go to church every now and then or put a smile on your face when your whole life is a mess. It's about whether or not there has been genuine transformation from the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. So the first question that I have here regarding how we inspect our fruit 
is this. Is there proof of life? Is there proof of life? You notice in verse 1, Jesus says, I am the true vine. It's indicating the existence of false vines. There are many different religions. There are many different things that people say about how to get to heaven and how to have a satisfying life. But Jesus says that I am the one that is the true vine. I'm the true way to life. He is the only door. He is the one that is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. And you notice in verse 3, he says, Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. And so the, the cleanliness that he's talking about is salvation, that your sins have been washed away completely free from that guilt and free from that shame because of the work of Christ. It doesn't come in any other vine or any other religion. But you notice in verse 2, he starts talking about branches. Who are the branches or what are the branches? A branch here is anyone who claims to be a disciple of Jesus. Notice I said that. They claim to be a disciple of Jesus. And so there are two types of dis disciples. One disciple is a disciple who is alive. And the other disciple is a disciple who is dead. One has life, one does not have life. And Jesus is saying that there are branches that are living and branches that are dead. Jesus came to bring life, and all true disciples are alive. Just like fruit can never come from a detached branch, from a detached tree, um, in, in the same way, if you do not bear fruit, then you yourself are not connected to Jesus. If your life shows no evidence of Jesus, then you do not belong to him. If there's no fruit, then you're still dead and you're separated from Christ. And those that are clean and forgiven have life that is in Christ. But those that are dead, those that are the dead disciples, as we're talking about here, there's no life being present in them. Jesus has some strong words about them. Look at verse 2. He says, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, what does he do with them? He takes them away. So no fruit means that there's no genuine saving faith in the person's life. So again, we're looking at our fruit. We're inspecting the evidence in our life. Is there genuine transformation? And if there's not, if there's no sign that Jesus has started to change you and has produced his life in you, then that's a red flag. And he says further in verse 6 that those that are saying they're disciples but don't produce fruit, this is what he says there. He says that they're thrown away like a branch and they wither and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and they're burned. This is a clear reference to hell, eternal separation from God. The Bible tells us in Revelation 20 verse 10, and the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And so this is why Jesus is coming before these disciples and he's saying, make sure you inspect your fruit to see whether or not you truly have life. Because if you don't have life, you are forever going to be separated from him. No fruit means that you have no life in the vine. They have a superficial attachment to the vine. Jesus had said that they're like the goats that are amongst the sheep. They're like the bad fish that are amongst the good fish. They are like the tares amongst the wheat. They exist. They might pose as disciples. They look like branches like everybody else, but the difference is that those that are truly followers of Christ will produce life, and those that don't will not have life and will not produce fruit. There are people that are professors, but they are not possessors. They profess to know Jesus, but they do not have any fruit at all. So the first question that I would ask you to ask in inspecting your fruit is, is there proof of life? You know what it's like to have proof of life. If you're living, your heart's beating, your pulse is going, you understand that. Well, look at your spiritual life. Is there fruit? If you know there's fruit, then you know the Holy Spirit lives in you, and you know that you're saved. If there's no fruit, 
then there's no life and you need to be saved today. Leading to the second thought, not only do we need to inspect and ask, is there proof of life? But we need to ask, is there proof of relationship? Let's look at verse 7. It says, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. You see, our personal relationship with Jesus gives us the privilege of being able to pray to the God who created all things. Relationships are maintained and strengthened through communication. God communicates through us primarily through his word, through the Bible. And we respond to God through prayer. He says here that whatever we ask for, we will receive, but it's not a blank check. Some of you are like, I'm going to start praying if it means I can just get whatever I want to. But there are some qualifications we need to look at here. Firstly, the prayer Jesus promises to answer must be offered in his name, which means it has to be consistent with his person and his will, and so that he might display his glory through it. Secondly, the promise is only to those who abide in Christ. And we're going to talk about that word abide a lot here in just a few moments, but the promise that God will give you whatever you ask is only if you abide in him. And thirdly, it speaks about Christ's words are abiding in the one making the request. So in other words, the word of God is guiding our prayers. God will not answer all prayers. In fact, the Bible says in Psalm 66 verse 18, if I had cherished iniquity in my heart, God will not listen. So if you have unconfessed sin in your heart and in your life, don't expect God to answer your prayers. You have to confess it and genuinely repent of it. In James chapter 4, verse 3, it says, You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. And so there are prayers that Jesus will not answer. But the prayers that he do, does answer are similar to what we see here in verse 7, as well as 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. Those verses say, and this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that he hears us, and whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. This is the fruit of answered prayer. You know you have a relationship with God if you pray to God and he answers your prayers. No answered prayer might be proof that there is no relationship. So again, inspect your fruit. Is there a sign of life? Is there a sign of relationship? If all your prayers are is just going to the ceiling and doesn't get any further than that, you need to continue to think about whether or not you truly are connected to the vine. Thirdly, is there proof of love? This is the third test to inspect our fruits. In verse 10, notice what it says here. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. So we demonstrate love. This is a big theme of this passage. We demonstrate our love for Jesus through obedience. Jesus is not saying, if you want me to love me, if you want me to love you, then keep my commandments. Here's an amazing thing I want everybody to understand today. The love that God the Father has for God the Son is a perfect, awesome love. And you are connected to that vine, and so share in the love that God the Father has for God the Son. In other words, you are, your, God's love for you is not based on how good you are or how much you do for him. God loves you, period. You need to understand that today. So love in God is not something you earn. Some of you grew up in homes where you felt like you had to make certain grades or your parents won't love you, or you had to have so many touchdowns and home runs or your dad wouldn't even talk to you, and you felt like you were always trying to earn your father's or your mother's love. But here the Bible is telling us that you don't earn his love. He just loves you. He just loves you. Why? Because you're in the sun, and he loves the sun. Is there proof of love in your life? 
A disciple that lives in persistent disobedience, willful disobedience against the Father, has shown that there is no proof of love. For someone to say, I know that I'm a Christian, but I don't really care about living for Jesus. That is saying that they don't love Jesus and that they're not connected to the vine. If you are connected to the vine and you have a saving faith relationship, you will in turn love the vine, love Jesus, and you're going to want to show that love to him through obedience. So as we look at verse 12 and 13, we're going to see even further evidence of this. Jesus says, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. The greatest love of all is not romantic or erotic. The greatest love of all is sacrificial, agape love. And that's what Jesus is talking about. So an amazing thing happens. You remember how I told you that Jesus gives you a new heart? He gives you a heart to be able to love others the way that he loves you. He's willing to sacrifice, give his life for you, and that's the love that God gives us to be able to love others. And so when I ask you, is there proof of love? Number one, are you being obedient, showing your love to the Father? And then number two, are you loving others, willing to sacrifice, willing to put other people's needs in front of your own? Being a Christian is not about getting, getting, getting. It's about giving, giving, giving. So is there proof of love? Have you inspected your fruit? Is there proof of life? Is there proof of relationship? Is there proof of love? But there's a second action we need to understand today, and this one's hard. I wish I could make this easier for you, but not only do we need to inspect our fruit, but we also need to expect God's pruning. We need to expect God's pruning. Let's look at verse 2 of John chapter 15. It says there, every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. This is the vine dresser or the farmer. So the two things that the farmer does here, he takes away those that do not bear fruit. And every branch that does bear fruit, what does he do? He prunes. Why does he prune us? That it may bear more fruit. Keep that thought in mind. Look at verse 8. By this my father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. So Jesus is saying to us that if you want to know whether or not you're a Christian, if you are a true disciple, if you are a fruit-bearing branch, one way in which you can know that beyond a shadow of the doubt is that you have experienced God's pruning. And the reason God prunes us is so that we produce fruit. And the reason why producing fruit is important is because it says there in verse 8 that that glorifies God. And so, Christian, look inside your heart today. Is glorifying God important to you? Is that something that you want to do in your life? If so, when Jesus says, this is how you glorify God, star it, circle it, highlight it, underline it, do whatever you got to do so that your mind says, that's what I live for. I live for the purpose of producing fruit through the vine and glorifying my Father. But what does it mean to prune? What does it mean to prune? Those of you who have had trees of pretty much any sort kind of understand this concept. It means to take shears and to cut back or to trim the branches. And there are three thoughts behind God's pruning that we need to look at here today. To begin with, God prunes for our growth. He prunes for our growth. God is going to do whatever it takes in order for his true disciples to bear more fruit. He's not content to let you stay on the vine and produce very little fruit. If the vine dresser, the farmer, if the father sees that you are connected to the vine and you're not producing a lot of fruit, if you are a genuine believer in Christ, God is mercifully going to take his holy shears and start pruning you. He's determined to shape you into something much better and much more beautiful than you are right now. What he is doing is he is making you more like 
Jesus. See, like with a tree, a farmer will cut off the parts of the branches that are dying, that are not fruit-bearing. You cut those off because all they're doing is just affecting the whole look of the tree. They're not going to produce any good fruit, so you cut it off, and then you hope for better growth, right? In the same way, the father prunes by removing anything that is hindering the production of fruit in your life. The father prunes us for our growth, but secondly, he prunes us through his word. He prunes us through his word. God uses his word as it is a pruning knife. The Bible says in Hebrews 4.12 that the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and of spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. So that's how God uses the word. He shows us where there is deadness in our life that is not producing fruit. And as we study the word, the Holy Spirit will bring about conviction and we'll see where we are falling short, where we are not producing fruit. And the Holy Spirit will go, cut that off. Why? Because he wants there to be fruit in our lives. The Bible further says in Hebrews 12, 6, that God disciplines those whom he loves. He uses his word to comfort the afflicted and to afflict the comfortable. One of the greatest temptations, I think, for the American Christian is to fall into comfort. When you fall into comfort, you're going to fall into complacency. And as you get into complacency, there is very little fruit production there. That's when God disciplines us. Just like a parent is going to discipline his child, he does it because he loves the child. Not because he's being mean or trying to be controlling, but because he says, son, what you're doing there is not right. We want to correct that behavior so that you live the way that is right. In the same way, God sometimes will discipline us. If you have never been disciplined by the hand of God, the Bible says that you're not one of his. Because God disciplines those whom he loves. It's painful, but he does. A third thing that we see regarding God's pruning is not only does he do it for our growth and through his word, but he prunes in our afflictions, our trials, our tribulations that we go through in this life. The Christian life is not utopia on the earth where you get saved and then you just think everything's going to be peachy and everything's going to be rosy and fine. It's not like that at all. Pruning does not necessarily mean that God is punishing you. We live in a fallen world. And being in a fallen world, there are hard things you're going to experience. You're going to experience loss. You're going to have difficult relationships with other people. You're going to have stress and pressure. And God can use these afflictions that we go through each and every day of our life to prune us if we respond to them the right way. As you're going through an affliction, take time to think about the fact that God might be shaping you through this affliction, which is why James said we consider it pure joy when we go through these trials. Sounds weird that James would say something like that, but what he was getting at is Jesus is making me more like him through these hard times. And so God loves us and he is shaping us into something more beautiful. No matter what your circumstance is, Romans 8.28 says that God can work together all things together for the good to those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. So God has a purpose through our sorrows, through our afflictions. He can prune us that we might become more like Jesus and thus produce fruit in our lives. And so we've seen so far that we need to inspect our fruit. We need to expect God's pruning. But there is a third action we need to take today, and it's so very crucial. We need to reject self-reliance. We need to reject self-reliance. To be a Christian does not mean you just simply do the best that you can do and hope for the best. A lot of people get burnt out when they live a Christian life like that. You see, we can have fruit of our own efforts. It's called the fruit of self-righteousness. But self-righteousness does not please God, it does not honor God, and it does not advance the gospel of Jesus. 
The only way we're going to please God, the only way we're going to advance the gospel is if we have his fruit from his work in us and through us. And so the key to the Christian life, you want it? Here it is. The key to the Christian life is Christ's life in the Christian. If you want to live a life that produces a lot of fruit and glorify the Father, you need to understand that it's not about you trying harder, you doing more. Well, maybe I need to pray more. Maybe I need to work more. Maybe that's all the, you say all these things that you feel like you got to do. But the key to producing fruit is allowing the vine to produce fruit through you. You are connected to that vine, and that vine is working and producing life, and that vine will never die because it's defeated death, and it will forever be alive. And so there is life flowing through that vine, and as we're connected to it, life will go through us as well. Jesus is saying that true disciples are connected to him and that they get their life from him. So here's what I want you to note. What Jesus is saying here in John chapter 15 is simply this. Live out your connection to me. If you're saved, you are connected to that vine. And Jesus says repeatedly here, abide, abide, abide. And what it means is, is that we live out that connection to the life that we have in the vine. So, you notice that the key to the Christian life is Christ's life in the Christian. We are united to him by faith, and because of that, we have the power to live in a way that pleases God. And verse 5, I think, is so key. This is one of my favorite verses in all of the Bible. Look at what it says. I am the vine. This is the second time he said this now. You are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, listen to this, he it is that bears much fruit. And notice the next part. For apart from me, you can do Nothing. So, this very sermon is a waste of your time if the Holy Spirit's not in it. If we try to do things in our own power, we have goals to knock on doors, we're just going to go out and do it to say that we did it. If if that's our attitude, then we're wasting time. It's not going to produce the fruit that God wants us to produce. And so the way that we are able to have power is this word abide. And in verses 1 through verse 17, it is mentioned 10 times. Abide, abide, abide. So I have three quick principles here about how we're to abide. Number one, abide in the spirit. The word abide is the Greek word meno, M-E-N-O is the way it's transliterated. And what it means to abide is it means, you mean, it means to remain, it means to continue in a fixed state, or to endure. So how does this work? How do we abide then? Well, when you are saved, you are connected to that vine, and the Holy Spirit indwells within you. What the Holy Spirit does is he draws us to Christ, he convicts us of our sin, He produces Christ-likeness in our lives, and he empowers us to live for Jesus. When people say that they trust Jesus as Lord and Savior, when they have genuinely done that, what happens next is, is that the life of Jesus begins to flow from the vine to the branches, and the branches produce fruit. It's a similar way that sap is running through the tree, goes to the branches, and the sap then produces that life, and fruit is also produced. When you are saved, Jesus has made you alive. His spirit indwells within you, and he empowers you to live for Jesus. So what do we do? We respond by humbling ourselves daily and saying, God, without you, I can do nothing. I know I'm connected to you, so let your life be lived through me. Let your Holy Spirit empower me. Let your Holy Spirit fill me. We see in Galatians 5, 16, it says, I say, walk by the Spirit, and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. Some of you are struggling with how to get victory over the flesh today. Galatians 5, 16, memorize that verse this week. When you are walking by the Spirit, you're not going to gratify the desires of the flesh. Ephesians 5, 18, be filled with the Spirit. 
Acts 1.8, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. In other words, if you want to live out the Christian life and have a fruit-producing, God-glorifying life, it has to happen by the Holy Spirit. Otherwise, you can do nothing. You had nothing to do with your salvation, and you further have nothing to do with the production of fruit in your salvation. It is all a work of God. So we abide in the Spirit. Secondly, we abide through discipline. Spiritual disciplines are not legalism. If you notice in verse number 11, I want to read this verse. This is another great one. These things, Jesus says, I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. So when you're abiding in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is producing his fruit, and we're going to see this in a couple weeks. One of the fruit is joy. Jesus is 100% joy, and so you're going to be able to have joy in your life. But here is what we have to take note of. How do we get this joy? And the answer is by abiding in Christ. We abide in him. The Holy Spirit works through two key disciplines in order to produce joy in your life. And so if you think about your life and say, well, preacher, I just don't have any joy right now. I got all these hard circumstances in my life. How can I have joy? How can you preach on joy when there are people dying and people sick and people scared? And the answer is, is that joy is not contingent on circumstances. If you're connected to that vine, the vine has joy, and you will too, if you abide in Christ. Those afflictions that you're going through, the Holy Spirit is saying, cling to me. Abide in me, and I will produce joy, joy that is inconceivable during these circumstances. That's what the Holy Spirit does. So what are the two disciplines? The first is prayer. Prayer is mentioned in verse 7 as well as verse 16 in this passage. Jesus is not talking about rote praying where you say the same things over and over again without any thought or feeling, but he's talking about spirit-led relationship-driven prayer, where you're connecting with the very heart of God. The Holy Spirit works through that prayer to produce joy. Then we also see the Word of God as the second discipline, reading, studying, memorizing the Word of God, the Bible. Mentioned in verse 3, verse 7, verse 10, verse 17. Listen to me now. Daily spend unhurried time in His Word to be able to hear from Him to be able to know that he is with you, to reassure yourself of his promises. And as you do that, the Holy Spirit produces joy in your life. And so disciplines are not legalism, but God works through, the Holy Spirit works through these disciplines to produce joy and fruitfulness in your life. So abide in the Spirit, abide through discipline, but thirdly, abide with your affections. Abide with your affections. As we've seen here, our obedience to Christ flows through our love for him. We do not obey Jesus because we fear the consequence of what would happen if we do not obey Jesus. There are some people who say, well, I got to go to church because if I don't go to church, something bad's going to happen to my truck. As though God's just like a cosmic lightning shooter just trying to make your life as miserable as possible. Listen, some people live like that. No. We obey Jesus, not because we fear bad things are going to happen, but we obey Jesus because we love him, right? We respond to his love with love. So, what that means is, is that your aim as a Christian should be, I want to love Jesus more. How can I love Jesus more? Because there are a lot of things in this world that are competing for your heart, if you haven't noticed. There are a lot of things that are idols. There are a lot of things that are going to try to take over your mind and your heart and your body and life. These things are tough, so how do you love Jesus more? And the answer is this, that you have to learn how to stir your affections to love Jesus more. And while you're doing that, you also have to cut out the things that are robbing you of those affections. So there are things you can do, things that that gravitate towards loving Jesus more, and there are things that you need to get rid of that gravitate towards loving Jesus less. So it starts with Bible study and prayer. If you want to love Jesus more, and you are neglecting the Bible, and you're neglecting prayer, you're you're not going to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You just can't. 
So spend time in the Word. Spend time in prayer. Also, your affections can be stirred if you have a church family who loves you and can encourage you. Talk to them. Love them. Get to know them. Have their wisdom poured into your heart and pour your wisdom into their lives. Be there for one another. Comfort one another during life's afflictions. Pray for one another. Those kind of things will help you to love Jesus more. Also, we know that we love Jesus more when we, uh, I, I don't know, just sometimes I'm, I'm in my car and, and I'm driving and, you know, it's not a good thing to close your eyes or to lift your hands, but some Christian music might be on and I want to praise God through that, right? Have you been there? That can stir your aff- affections for Jesus, where you love Jesus more as you're worshiping. Keep your eyes open, by the way, in 10 and 2, right? 9 and 3, whatever it is. But, but do that. It's a good, good thing. Those things, listening to uh, expository preaching that goes through the text, and as, as the Holy Spirit reveals to you, that's truth. That should cause your heart to overwhelm with joy, your affections to be stirred. So do those things, but also look at your life and what's robbing you of those affections. There are things that you're doing in your life that after you do it or while you're doing it, you can't say the words, praise Jesus. And the Holy Spirit's had to work on me with this, as he has you as well. It's a temptation for me to watch too much television, and before long, watching these TVs and these movies, I find myself kind of numb to the dark things of the world. And I find my, my, myself being entertained by things that really break the heart of God. And I'm not being as compassionate. I'm not being as patient with my family as I need to be. I also find that I can lose contentment if I endlessly scroll on social media. Just don't know why I'm doing it, but I'm doing it. And I find myself not as joyful as I was before. For me, I have to be careful. I love sports, and if I watch them too closely and I'm yelling at some 20-year-old kid for dropping a ball... probably an indication that I'm not walking in the Spirit when that's happening, right? When I look at the fruit of the Spirit, it's not love, joy, peace, yelling at 20-year-old kids who drop the ball. It's not in there. I've looked. You can look too. So there's not that, there's, there's just, those kind of things don't help me. Those kind of things don't stir my affections for Jesus. When I see the, 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 the team and I'm yelling at the team or whatever, that kind of stuff is not helping me love Jesus more. And I'm not talking about legalism here. We're not talking about trying to earn your salvation. But there are things you should do just because it's wise. Just because there are things that are going to try to captivate your heart more than Jesus. These things are not sins per se. Okay? But yet you can give your heart over to them, can't you? You can waste time. You can have your joy killed through them, can't you? It's happened to me. So if I'm abiding in Christ, my heart in my mind, need to focus on him and him alone. And so we have looked at Jesus' teaching on fruit. And what have we seen? That we need to inspect our fruit. We need to expect God's pruning. But thirdly, we see we need to reject self-reliance. It's not about us doing it. It's about him doing it through us. So the question I would have for you all today in wrapping this up is so very important. Are you really attached to the true vine? Is there genuine fruit in your life, or are you painting fruit on your trees, trying to fool everybody, but God and you both know the truth? No fruit, Jesus is very clear here, no fruit means no salvation. There are two types of disciples. The real ones that produce fruit, they're alive. And the fake ones, they're dead. There's no fruit The real ones are connected to the vine and have eternal life and will forever be with Jesus. The fake ones are gathered up, they're burned. It's not about religion. It's not about good works. You must be born again through a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. If you have not trusted in Jesus as your Savior and Lord, you are still dead in your sin. Brothers of you here today, Abide, 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 
Ten times Jesus is saying it. Why does he say it so often? Because we need to hear it so often. It is so important that we abide, abide, abide. So what does that mean? Check your affections. Stay disciplined in the word and in prayer. Be filled with the Holy Spirit and realize that God has put you on this earth for such a time as this. There are people terrified right now. There are people that are lost, that are going to hell right now. We need to be fruit-bearing, God-glorifying Christians. And if you're here today and you're just saying, I just, I just, I'm not doing that right now. The Holy Spirit is drawing you to realize that it's not about you. It's about just surrendering, saying, God, work through me. And he will. He hears those humble prayers. So let's bow our heads in prayer and commit our time over to him. Father, I thank you for this passage. And I pray today in the name of Jesus that we would inspect our fruit. And God, if there's someone here in this room, maybe they fooled everybody else, God, but they don't fool you. And I pray, God, that you would just show them the truth, that if there's no fruit, there's no salvation. If there's no evidence that you have transformed them, then they haven't been transformed. And I pray today, God, that you would just show them that you love them, but that you also sent Jesus to die on the cross for them. And I pray, God, that they would be saved. And God, for everybody else here, I pray we would be obedient, that we would show forth our love for Jesus by being obedient to your word. That we would hunger and thirst for it and not be satisfied with the pursuits of this world. God, we love you today and we know your word does not return void. And I pray that your word would produce tremendous fruit in every soul that's here in this room. And I pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to invite you to stand with me. Our musicians will come forward. We'll have counselors over here at this door. And we're going to have a time of response. Go ahead and stand, if you will. And as we have this time of response, how is God wanting you to respond to his word? Are you attached to the true vine? Are you saved today? If you're not saved today, the invitation is come and be saved. Jesus is the true vine. He is the only way to be saved. He is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through him. I know everybody is a good moral person in here, right? But it doesn't come through our religion or how good we are. We're sinners who need a Savior, and Jesus is the only Savior. Come right now and be saved. For everybody else, these altars are open. I'm here to pray with you. You can come to a council. You can pray right where you are. But be saved today and make sure that your life is producing fruit. If God's led you to join this church family, you can come, and I'd be glad to sh share with you how you can go about doing that. But as we have this time of response, be obedient to Jesus. Abide in him, and you will bear much fruit. So let's sing and give it to Jesus.
Amen. You may be seated. God is good all the time and all the time. God is good. The great thing about being a part of a church family is that we love one another through times of trial and affliction and mourning and sorrow, and, and we do love everybody that's going through some of those difficulties right now. Church, we do have a number of things that we need to cover as, uh, as we're about to dismiss here. Uh, to begin with, don't forget that during this month of September, we will be giving for the Myers-Mallory State Missions offering. There is some information outside these doors over here if you're interested in seeing some more about that. Um, the the Myers-Mallory State Missions offering goes to support Alabama WMU, disaster relief, church planting efforts, missions, and church revitalization. It's a very important offering. We have three major offerings during the year, and this is one of those three. So please give as the Lord would lay upon your heart. You can text to give if you just text that amount and put missions afterwards. It will go straight to the offering as well. Also, don't forget, uh, tonight we don't have any services, uh, so just enjoy that holiday with your family. But next week, a lot of things are starting up, including OCD, which is our off-campus discipleship. That will be at 5 o'clock. We look forward to that beginning yet again. All right, at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Haley and um, Emily, right, and, and, and Amanda, all right, and they're going to come and share another word of announcement. with the evangelism team this year with a, with a bunch of other people, but um, there are so many people hurting in our community. It seems like every, every day we turn on our social media or we hear of, of someone else that's hurting. And it's nothing new. There, there, brokenness has always been, you know, just things like this right here in our state. And so many people have lost hope and don't have hope. And we ha we're not the answer. This church is not the answer, but we have the answer, and that answer is Jesus. And some people don't have Jesus, and they don't have any hope. And so for the month of September, we are focusing on taking the gospel to our neighborhood. Um, sharing the gospel shouldn't be, this is on my heart, sharing the gospel shouldn't be something we do. It should be who we are. And as true believers in Christ, when we abide in Christ, we shouldn't, we should, can't stand to be, be much less, as true believers in Christ, we should want to tell other people about that hope, and not contain it to ourselves. Think back to the person that introduced you to Jesus, or that person that maybe spoke boldly and told you about Jesus, and that might be why you're sitting here today. Um, it shouldn't end with us. We don't want it to end with us. We want to keep and so for the month of September, we as First Baptists, we are going to take that month and focus on being sold out in September for Christ. And we want to take the gospel to our neighborhood. And there's so many people that may never set foot in our church to hear the gospel, but we can take it to them where they are. We can meet them right where we, they are. So right out here in this area, we have a table. And you can sign up. There is a list of um, different families, different streets. And we ask that you sign up maybe in groups of two, three, four. Pair up with somebody. It can be a friend, a spouse, your children. It can be somebody in your Bible study group or Sunday school class. And we want to take it to their door. And it might not be that you want to take it to their door. It might be that you want to go up to the park and walk and, and meet somebody. But we want, our whole goal is we want to be able to try to bring back the gospel with these people and with our friends and with our neighbors in our community. And it may be that you, the conversation doesn't go there, and all you can do is maybe invite them to church. But we want to do that too. 
and their whole goal is to um, introduce them to Jesus. Because there's many people even here in Hope Staff that don't know Jesus as their Savior, and they don't have that hope. So um, we're going to focus the whole month of September, and when you get with your group, you can sign up, just write your name, say you're claiming Third Street, or you're claiming the ballpark. You write your names on there. Out here, we have little tracks out there if you need help. Um, we're going to take the whole set, the whole month of September. So it, if, if your group is good for a Monday night or if it's good for a Sunday after church, you just go whenever is good for you and whenever is convenient for you. And if, the, and if you have to go to your mission. I have to echo what Haley said. It's not like a choice. Do I want to spread the gospel? But then you, you, you are if you're a Christian. And it's commanded. So in Acts, we're told to go out. And if we are disciples of Christ, we're going to follow that command. And if you're like me, I'm not one that initially I used to be like, hey, I just want to, you know, catch up to strangers and talk to them. But um, God has pushed me to grow in that direction to where I don't have a problem doing that anymore. But it, it did take some training. So if you're like I used to be where you're hesitant, maybe you don't know how to start that conversation, and you want to be trained, we are going to have a training day. So on September 19th, um, we are going to meet and have lunch after church. So if you're if you're just like, oh, I want to do it, I think what Haley was talking about was fantastic. I want to write my name on that list out there, but I'm just a little scared. I feel a little uncomfortable. Then we want you that day. And if you're somebody who you're like, hey, I've done this before. I have some insight to give others who aren't comfortable. We want you to come that day, too, to help us to to foreign group and, and to train. So so I want everybody to kind of mark their calendars on, se- on September 19th and be there. Of course, if you're not there, you can still sign up and go out. But um, I do want, if you feel like, hey, I'm a little uncomfortable to know that um, Brother brother Ryan wants us to be trained, so we're, we're ready. We're ready to go out like we're commanded to. Thank you so much. And there you see that word uh, of announcement there on the slide. Our church goal is 300 contacts. And what we're calling a contact is that the intention of the conversation is to get to a gospel presentation. Okay. So you, you guys just determine uh, that in, on the honor system. But please go over here, check that out, grab you some tracks, make a commitment. It's going to be a great September. It's through the power of the Holy Spirit. It's not because any of you guys are, are are, are better communicators than others, uh, but it's all through the Holy Spirit. And so pray that we would be obedient as we love Christ. There are a lot of people that are hopeless right now and need to know about the hope that's in the gospel. So with that, we're going to sing about this great hope that we have in Jesus. Is there another word of announcement before we're dismissed? I just want to make sure. All right. Well, let's all stand, and then we will have this great song about how great our Jesus is. You are greater, greater than anything I know or see. You're stronger, stronger than the grave that wants out me. You are greater, greater than anything I know or see. You're stronger, you're stronger than the grave that wants out me. Your love is deeper and wider. In the highest place be lifted, I am still. Oh, you have and always will be something greater.